This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Even though the cost of solar and wind is dropping, renewables might not be sufficient to meet our clean energy demand in the future. However, nuclear power can play a key role in the decarbonization of our energy sector. And I'm not talking about nuclear fission. Rather, quite the opposite. I'm talking about fusion with its perpetual 30 years away target. But before you blow your fuse and start leaving your fusion jokes in the comments, there's been a major fusion development that we have to talk about, and it's kind of a nuclear bombshell. Poor choice of words, it's big news. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. I had a chance to speak to Dr. Martin Greenwald, a deputy director and senior research scientist at MIT, who's part of the team that achieved a pretty big fusion milestone. But before bursting out with the recent breakthrough on nuclear fusion, it's a good idea to take a step back and have a quick recap on nuclear power. Now, don't worry, I'll keep it high level as I don't want to burn out your brain or mine. But you can get nuclear energy through two processes, fission and fusion. Nuclear fission reactors are what we see around the world today. In a fusion reactor, you blast a neutron into an unstable uranium-235 atom to split it into smaller fragments, including more neutrons. These new particles will hit other uranium-235 atoms, which generate a chain reaction effect. The breakdown of the uranium isotope releases energy in the form of heat, which is then used to vaporize water. And that resulting steam can then be used to power a turbine to generate electricity. Now, as the name suggests, the fusion process is basically the opposite of fission. Instead of splitting, we're just putting things together. A fusion reactor replicates what happens naturally within the sun's core, which sounds scary, but it's not. Now, where hydrogen isotopes split and then merge into helium nuclei under astronomical temperatures and pressures, in this case, the fusion reaction produces four times more energy than what's obtained through the fission process. Instead of using uranium or plutonium, which both release long-lived radioactive particles, you feed hydrogen isotopes like deuterium and tritium into a fusion reactor. Deuterium is a stable element, and tritium radioactivity doesn't last very long. Besides being safer and more eco-friendly, the fusion fuel sources are more abundant and cheaper than fission fuels. And that's because you can extract deuterium from seawater, while you can get tritium during the fusion reaction itself when neutrons interact with elements like lithium. Or as Dr. Greenwald put it, It's a potentially ideal source of energy. First of all, the fuel is essentially unlimited. It's an extremely energy, energy density form of fuel. So a tenth of a gram of deuterium and three tenths of a gram of lithium, if fused in a power plant, would make enough electricity for an average American for uh, a year, a full year. And those few tenths of a gram, you wouldn't need, if it was in your pocket, you wouldn't even notice it. It's like lint, lint or something like that. Fusion's potential benefits over fission aren't just about higher energy production and fuel energy density, though. One of the biggest is probably one that you've thought of. The byproducts of fission are highly radioactive, and if they're not appropriately controlled, can contaminate the planet for decades. On top of that, fission's chain reaction can degenerate and potentially get out of control, causing a nuclear meltdown or explosion, which is what happened in Fukushima in 2011 after the tsunami hit the power plant and caused a series of failures. Now, this type of incident wouldn't happen in a tokamak, which is based on magnetic confinement fusion, or MCF. A tokamak is a donut-shaped chamber where you heat hydrogen isotopes up to 150 million degrees. And I don't know about you, but this is not the type of reactor I want Homer Simpson in charge of. At such a high temperature, their atoms are stripped of their electrons and turned into ions, and you're left with a superheated ionized gas, which is plasma. Under these conditions, the charged particles collide and fuse together, just like in the sun. Another safety net for fusion is that you can just stop the reaction by cutting off the fuel supply. In nuclear fission, this isn't the case. It can't melt down the way a fission plant can. It doesn't have the same kind of uh, waste materials. So it has all these advantages. And the other thing is it doesn't use a lot of land, a lot of water. So it's a very good complement to renewables. It could be used for uh, process heat for industry. So it would be relatively straightforward in, in, in certain industries like making demand. So based on all that, let's go for fusion. We've got our winner. That'd be great, but that's where the running joke of fusion always being 30 years away comes in. Nobody's produced a fully functional fusion power reactor yet. It takes an insane amount of energy to produce the heated plasma. So right now the power that you put into a fusion reaction is always higher than the thermal power that you get back out of it. To assess how well a reactor performs is referred to as the fusion energy gain factor, or the simple Q with a ratio. Basically, you just want a Q value higher than one, which is that thermal power break-even point within the reactor. 
but we're not even close to break-even. The Joint European Taurus, or JET, held a record ratio of 0.67, but the National Ignition Facility, NIF, just recently broke that with a Q of 0.7. But it's really important to note that Q isn't accounting for the full power and electricity required to run the facility, and how much electricity it can actually generate from that reaction. Q is just about the thermal power in versus the thermal power out. For the full picture, that accounts for all those additional costs in converting heat into electricity, basically producing more electricity than it takes to run the facility, we'd most likely be looking at a Q somewhere between 10 and 25. There's a lot of moving pieces. We have to learn to walk before we can run, and hitting a Q of one or higher is us learning to walk. That's why at this phase of fusion research, everyone focuses on just the Q ratio for the plasma reaction itself. Once we hit that, the focus will shift towards overall power gain. In 2025, the massive international fusion project that's known as ITER is supposed to start producing super hot plasma with a Q greater than 10 in France. Now, even though the project was born in the 1980s, construction of the tokamak only started in 2007. Once it's complete, ITER will be the world's largest fusion rig, which isn't necessarily a good thing. Due to its size and its scope, it's taking a long time and tens of billions of dollars to build. Plus, it's designed to be a testing facility and not a working reactor. And it won't reach full operation until 2035. So even if it's 100% successful, we still need to then go through the whole process of building out the final working reactor design. Now, I know that sounds a lot like we're still 30 years away from having a fully operational fusion reactor, but there has been some electrifying breakthroughs recently from smaller and more nimble approaches like what Dr. Greenwald has been working on. And one of the biggest challenges with MCF fusion reactors is the incredible magnetic field that they have to generate to contain the plasma. Massive magnets ringing the rig, or the donut, create an intense magnetic field. This invisible bubble traps the blisteringly hot electrically charged slurry in mid-air near the center of the reactor. Being kept away from the rig walls, the plasma won't melt them. And just this September, we found out that 2021 is going out with a nuclear fusion bang. Before getting to this big piece of fusion news, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, CuriosityStream. If you'd like to watch more videos on topics just like this, you really should check it out. They have thousands of documentaries and nonfiction shows on pretty much every topic you can think of. If you enjoy science and technology, which I'm assuming you do since you're watching my channel, they have documentaries like Engineering the Future, which explores one of the world's largest wind farms being built off the English coast and the incredibly harsh conditions that challenge the project. Curiosity Stream really does have something for everyone, including 35 collections handpicked by experts, including some award-winning exclusives and originals. Best of all is that you can stream them to any device, anytime, anywhere. It really is smart TV for your smart TV. And they have a special offer for all of you if you sign up with the code UNDECIDED. You'll get an entire year for just $14.99. It's an incredible deal. Link in the description below, and thanks to Curiosity Stream and to all of you for supporting the channel. So back to 2021 going out with a nuclear fusion bang, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, along with Commonwealth Fusion Systems startup, CFS, designed one of the most powerful magnets ever created on Earth. This joint experiment hit on something extremely important, managing to generate an incredible magnetic field with far less power. To achieve this milestone, they used something called a High Temperature Superconductor, or HTS. The major innovation is actually not that new. Back in 2015, MIT proposed using the superconducting tape in their device design, and I mean a lot of it. The test magnet used 267 kilometers, or 166 miles of tape. This material retains superconductivity at high temperatures, which generates a more intense magnetic field. Martin gave me some really nice insights about this tape. The new material, the high temperature superconductor, which is really a ceramic-like uh, compound of uh, rare earths and barium copper oxide. It's a fairly fragile material, but people learned how to put it down as a thin film on a strong substructure. And it turns out there was a breakthrough in technology that we could take advantage of that we weren't responsible for. It was an invention discovery really by some IBM scientists working at a lab in Zurich in the 80s. And that was high temperature superconductors. It didn't really look like an engineering material, but, and a lot of people thought, well, this is really interesting scientifically, but this will never be a practical, you'd never be able to build a magnet or a, a wire out of this. But we followed this very closely because we thought, well, this material could allow us to make a superconducting magnet that ran at high enough fields. 
This is something that I find fascinating about fusion development and why it's taking so long. It's taken decades to learn about new materials and techniques that can be applied to successfully control a fusion reaction at scale. Martin brought up a point that I hadn't considered. The advantage of using this material wasn't just about making a magnet more powerful, but also making it more energy efficient. You can make great experiments and we're able to get very high fields with copper magnets, but they consume an enormous amount of electricity, enormous amount of power. So that turned out to be a good deal as a stronger magnetic force translates into a 10 times greater power generated by the reactor. As a result, the MIT design is meant to achieve net energy gain in a much smaller unit. If you are able to go to higher fields, you can make the linear dimension smaller. You can shrink the size. When you compare it to the ITER system, which uses low temperature superconductors, the spark reactor that MIT and CFS are designing is only 2% of its size. And that's a significant reduction in construction cost and time. But does it work? The big milestone that MIT and CFS just achieved in their recent test was putting together one full-size magnet and running it through tests as if the full tokamak was built out. That test went extremely well. But just how well? It reached a magnetic field of 20 Tesla. That's the units we use. It's not the highest field ever produced or the highest field with HTS ever. Those were produced in small magnets, but it's the combination of the size and the field uh, that really put it in a class by itself. The bottom line is that this test proved out the math and the theory behind Commonwealth Fusion Systems Spark Reactor Design. This test was the final proof and concept they needed before moving on to the full build out. And it worked very successfully. And it really sort of unlocked, it was the last piece of the puzzle to allow us to proceed. So we had done work on the, on the physics basis for this new experiment, and we published that about a year ago. Now, I don't know about you, but I was super charged when I heard all about this. And it's not just from my conversation with Martin. After three years of research, scientists nearly doubled the intensity of the field, which led to a tenfold increase in the power generation. That's why the project leaders now herald this to be a key milestone for building a low carbon, energy positive fusion reactor. MIT and CFS are now aiming for the stars. In 2025, they'll demonstrate Spark, the world's first demonstration fusion device that creates net energy output. Now we've just got to finalize the design and build the machine. And we hope that it'll be operating uh, by 2025 and producing fusion power shortly thereafter. So how much power are we talking about? What we use for our estimates of how it will perform is the same set of physics rules that are used for the ITER experiment. Remember that ITER is predicted to have a Q greater than 10, and so does Spark. To develop this stellar prototype, CFS, raised over $250 million, you can see why this may spark a revolution in nuclear fusion that could drastically shrink the infamous 30-year window. And that sounds amazing. But is there anything bursting that magnetic fusion bubble? Because of the compact spark design, you'll have a greater power density, which means a higher heat load generated in the reactor core during the fusion process. This higher heat load makes managing the high temperatures a bit of a challenge. The structure surrounding the magnet needs to be kept cold enough to absorb those thermal stresses. But we won't have to wait long to find out how well it handles that, because in four years, the spark test plant may be able to verify these technical features. In the meantime, the project leaders are planning a lot of work behind the scenes. Milestones now are, they're maybe less flashy. You know, the completion of the first building, uh, the completion of the test cell, arrivals of some major components. So they're not gonna be big flashy things, but very important for the project. And there's one thing I have to address. If you've been following fusion research, you'll know that all of these fusion reactor tests are typically running for a few seconds at a time. That's not necessarily an issue with fusion reactors in general, but it's how these test devices are built to save on cost while they prove out key concepts. Those experiments often have very, very short pulse lengths due to the physics of the experiment. I mean, the machines are not designed to, to be long pulsed. They would have to be considerably more expensive. There would be much more costs up front. Now, I can hear you already. Is fusion going to happen in our lifetimes? If we produce net power in a device which can demonstrably scale up, that will attract the funding. It'll basically change the narrative from fusion in 30 years always to, okay, this is real. And it would attract the kind of investment to start building out as an industry. So that's our hypothesis. We're testing it. We have fairly audacious goals, but you kind of have to have audacious goals if you want to play in this particular uh, arena. I don't know if we're still going to be 30 years away from fusion in four years. <laughs> 
But jokes aside, I believe cheaper and safer nuclear power will be essential for the future of green energy. While there's still plenty of hurdles to overcome, this recent breakthrough proves that getting unlimited power from fusion may be a realistic and achievable goal sooner than you think. So what do you think of fusion? Do you think this recent milestone is a game changer? Jump in the comments below and let me know. And thanks as always to my patrons and welcome to new Supporter Plus members, David Whitehouse and Robert Clark. Your direct support really goes to helping to produce these videos. And speaking of which, if you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones I've linked to right here and subscribe and hit that notification bell if you think I've earned it. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.